the fact, the fact, the fact. All right, welcome everybody. We're live on uh, Jay's analysis. We will be having an open forum today, Q and A, debate, whatever you want to do. That, of course, is via the Discord, and we will also be taking <coughs> super chat questions as well. And you can super chat via the Streamlabs option in the description there. So, super chats are no longer via the normal super chat. You just do it through Streamlabs. It's the same process, exact same thing. So if you want me to uh, address your issues, your debate, your question, whatever, you can do that through Super Chats and then also through the Discord. So we'll be taking Discord live Q&A questions, challenges, people want to debate. You know what we do. We give you the floor. You can come. You can have as long as you want within reason to present whatever objections or disputes that you want to against uh, our position. So we open that up to any of the atheists, the Roman Catholics, the Protestants, Evangelicals, Muslims, pagans, and yes, other religions as well, Jews if they want to, but we don't typically get uh, a lot of proponents of Judaism in here. So whoever wants to can uh, present their arguments or questions. It doesn't have to be a debate. Uh, we had a lively Byzantine farting apologist last time, if you guys remember the guy who farted on live stream when he got nervous and of course lost the debate so hopefully we will have a, a clean air form of debate this time around where we won't stink up the live stream with uh gaseous bad arguments but father deacon uh and snack will be joining me as well as other uh, mods in the discord so whoever else is in there uh you feel free um the beautiful sister of tristana uh chastity Chasity Haggard joins us as well. If Chasity would like to speak, she may. She's free to. Shout out to Chasity. Or should we call you Chast? Yes, should we call you Chase? Yeah, should can, we call you, you Chastity? Me as a man for today. I okay, so you, it. so he is identifying specifically. Is that don't dead name? It's, uh, a, it's a Thursday thing. It's a federal offense to dead name Chastity. Chase Chastity Haggard. Welcome, everybody. Uh, if you would, hit like and share in the, the YouTube chat. Things are getting real. Things are getting crazy. So we would ask for your prayers uh, for things that are uh, the world and things getting crazy and crazy and crazier, 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 crazier. Well, I'll tell you what, Jay. Tell me what. The, the upshot, guys, is the end times is not boring. It is a lot of exciting stuff. So it is It is with a bang. It's not with a whimper, but with a bang. Yeah, we do need prayers, though. Faithful. All right, so we have open forum. Um, if anybody would like to uh, bring questions or, or Q&A, uh, Father Deacon and I and the other mods are here. So is anybody in the chat? Any challengers? Any questions? Any topics? Bring it forth. We're here. I even have my white boy whiteboard right here. Right here. Got my whiteboard. Yeah. I had a quick question. Someone mentioned on your last stream about uh, God being pure act in the incarnation, how that it's, uh, it's an issue, it's problematic. And you said that uh, something along the lines of how if he's always actualizing everything and he's actualizing one hypostasis, why isn't he actualizing the other two? Right? Um, could so could a Roman Catholic counter that by saying that he can't actualize the other two because it's logically impossible? No, the, the argument is not that he's actualizing other persons. The argument is that a being that is pure act has to have something other than himself or itself to actualize. That's what in Aristotle the word means. So Aristotle believes that the first cause is a first actualizer. He's pure energy, pure action. So there's always something other than himself. Now, the reason that we don't apply that argument necessarily, you could make an argument about generating of the sun, right? Because if God is pure act, then what is the distinction between generating and spirating? There would be a real distinction in the Trinity, right? But this is, this is just to speak of God in essence, definitionally, God via substance as pure act. And the problem is that in Aristotelian philosophy, pure act means that he's eternally pure act, 
He's always pure act. To act means to actualize. He's not actualizing himself. So Aristotle said he's always actualizing the other, something other than himself. So the argument is not about other persons. It could be, but it's not about that. It's about creation. Aristotle believes that there's an eternal prima materia, prime matter, that the first actualizer is eternally actualizing. Does that make sense? Yes, because if that's what he is by definition, he's gonna it's gonna necessitate him actualizing something from all eternity. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So there's never a time when he wasn't actualizing creation, and then he changed to become the actualizer of creation. That would mean right. if that happened, that would mean he has potentia. And in Roman Catholic theology, in terms of especially Thomism, but generally speaking, in Roman Catholic theology. Uh, God has absolutely no potential, no active or passive potential in any sense at all, period. That's why Basil says in Hexameron 2 that Aristotle's argument is stupid. Because if God is an eternal actualizer as a first principle, then he must have a second principle that he always actualizes. So there's a necessary relationship between the actualizer and what he actualizes between God and creation creation that's an eternal creation ba this is not my argument it's just Basil's argument in Hexameron 2 he says Aristotle's stupid because he has a dyad so that's why it's two persons is because the material world that the first actualizer is eternal actualizing is itself another eternal principle so Basil says well that's basically a two-headed God does that make sense yeah, that makes sense, but I thought that uh, the idea of him being pure act causes problems for the incarnation. I thought someone mentioned right, that. Right, it does, because how does one hypostasis enter into a mode of being that the other two do not? Yeah, and that's where I was going to ask, could they counter that by saying that the other two can't enter into a mode of being because it's logically impossible or something? Why would it be logically impossible for the Father and the Spirit to do it, but not the Son? I mean, I don't understand how that's even a coherent argument. It just sounds like okay. a, it sounds like an ad hoc rescue. The problem is with the doctrine of simplicity and then with the doctrine of pure act. They're defining God, in essence, as pure act. St. Maximus does not find, define God, in his essence, as pure act. He defines God as pure act in contrast to creatures, but in essence, we do not know what he is. So they collapse the two distinctions. They collapse economia into theology proper. Do you understand? Yes. And yes, you could take the, look, the pure act simplicity argument will apply to any level of distinctions in God, if you wanted to, right? So in other words, we could apply it to the distinction between generating and spirating. Is that a real distinction? Sure. Okay. Then is it something that's in the essence? How is God pure act if there's two different things going on in God? Right. And then their other doctrine of absolute divine simplicity probably doesn't even allow for a uh, distinction. What do you mean their other doctrine? Well, if God is absolutely simple, how can he have distinctions within himself, right? Right, so in other words, modal collapse argument does point out problems in any attempt to make distinctions in God that are only virtual, nominal, or conceptual. Okay. Right. The distinction between generating and spirating is not virtual, it's not nominal, it's not conceptual. It is, but it's it's you can conceptually distinguish because it's really distinguished. This is the whole paper cat epinoia that Bradshaw has. So can we make a conceptual distinction between uh, generating and spirating in our minds? Yes. How can we do that? Basil says, because it's a real distinction. What your mind is predicating is predicating on the basis of what's really distinct. Because there is a real distinction between generating and spirating, you can really distinguish those things in your mind. And some distinctions are purely conceptual, right? The distinction between a uh, bachelor and unmarried man is a conceptual distinction. There's not a real distinction in reality between those two things, right? But in our mind, we can distinguish them linguistically. But there is a real distinction between the sun and the spirit, because there's a real distinction between generating and spirating. Okay, so is that an action of the essence or an action of the persons? 
Well, it's an action of the person of the Father. That's why you have to begin your Trinitarian theology, not with the essence of God, but with the person of the Father. And that's what the Cappadocians do. So the Roman Catholics just simply don't accept Constantinople I and the Cappadocian teaching. And they think they do. They can say all day long that they do. But in fact, they don't. I, I'm almost done with this whole PhD thesis on that very topic. Right? Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nessa, and the transformation of divine simplicity. The whole book, the whole PhD thesis is about the fact that the Cappadocian doctrine of divine simplicity and distinctions in the Trinity is different from the Augustinian Latin and Selmian Thomistic West. Well, yeah. I mean, why is this even controversial? <laughs> it's like, how many, I mean, we, we had medieval councils called the Palamite councils that already told us this a thousand years ago. So we shouldn't even have to debate this. 800 years ago. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, that was it. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. We've got 183 in the live audience in the middle of the day. That's pretty good. If you would hit like and share, uh, feel free to support via Super Chats, and uh, I will give preference to the Super Chats. Joy says for $5, I'm glad I caught this live. Thank you, Jay. Well, thank you, Joy. Much appreciated. Bazed Ortho Guy says for 10 bucks. how do you explain praying to the saints uh, or to the Theotokos to a Protestant friend? Well, it's the best way to explain it is that we're asking for their intercession. So that's the best way to explain it. So it's no different than if I asked you to pray for me, nobody believes there's something wrong with doing that. Well, the saints that have gone on are not the dead. They are alive to God, as Jesus says. Remember when the Pharisees asked Jesus about, how do you say that you are alive when Abraham was, uh, you're not 30 years old, right? You're not 50 years old, right? Before Abraham was, I am, right? The saints are not dead, but alive to God. It's logically consistent, you know, the saints are alive in Christ and uh, they're still part of the church and the church is asking, um, you know, to pray for one another. It's, it's really biblical. Yeah. So it's the doctrine of the communion of saints. Yeah. But thank you for that uh, ortho guy. Hopefully that's helpful. And, if you know, uh, if you want more of the doctrine of Mary, then you look at the comparison between the Theotokos and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you look at the talk that I did uh, uh, a while back with Seraphim Hamilton, the original talk we did about a month ago, two weeks ago, whatever it was. Uh, we got into symbolism of the Theotokos from Ezekiel 44 and uh, Apocalypse 12. And those texts will kind of help to give a, a bigger picture of the importance of Mary in the scheme of redemption. Right. She's called Theotokos, Mother of God, in Luke 1. So that's not a pagan term. It's not made up. It's directly from Luke. All right. Uh, anybody else in Discord? Anybody else next up? Yeah. Uh, is it cool if I ask Father Deacon a question on Absolutely. his interpretation of Scripture real quick? Or sure. is, is that not? No. Okay. Um, uh, Father Deacon, in I'm an inquirer, by the way, so this is just a question. Um, oh, hi. Yeah. In, uh, in Mark 1, 9 through 11, it says, uh, after the Christ is baptized, it says, a voice came down from heaven. And um, I was just wondering if uh, Jesus was the word. I know that um, the Father was talking to him because it says the Spirit also descended upon him like a dove. So um, if if Christ is the word... How was the Father talking to him, if that makes sense? So this is Mark? Uh, Mark 1, 9 through 11. It's right after the Christ is baptized or when he's being baptized. Well, something that I actually say is, that as far as I understood it, it was uh, the, f um, the Father who actually speaks. Um, I, just because... Uh, Christ is the word. I don't think that permits God the Father from speaking. So it's uh, Mark 1. Uh, 9 through 11. That was just kind of my question was that um, so the Father can speak. It's not only Christ who can speak from the heavens. It's also a divine action. So it right. will be from the Father through the Son and the Spirit. And that's that's also maybe why all of them are present that, that right so that so one thing that uh is important to remember is that not every reference to um an action is identical to a hypostasis so sometimes the scriptures speak of different actions 
or they will refer to different persons of the Trinity under different energies or actions or attributes. For example, in Ezekiel, we saw the Son being referred to as the glory of God. Now, the person of the Son is not identical to the glory of God, because the glory of God is something shared between Father, Son, and Spirit. But the Son has a unique way or role or mode that he manifests the glory of God, and this is the doctrine of energetic manifestation or energetic procession. So every energy of God is common to all three persons. However, the persons have a unique mode or tropos by which they manifest that energy. So for example, in creating. Creating of the world is a unique Trinitarian action. However, each person in the Trinity has a unique role in actualizing that action. So the Father is the origin of creation. The Son is the arche or principle through which creation comes to be. And the Spirit is the perfecter, the or mover the rest of, the sun, yeah. of, of the created order. And yeah, like you know, We have this word perichoresis. Mm -hmm. just, uh, literally just, it's like a inner dance, but it's a, the sharing of uh, these actions of properties within the Trinity. Okay, so they all have the same will. They just have different modes of enacting that Correct. will, per se? Correct. Yep. Okay, thanks, guys. So just like in redemption, right? Uh, redemption is a Trinitarian work or action, but the persons have unique roles in the process or action of, re of redeeming us. For, so, for example, the Father's role is not to become incarnate. The Father's role is to send the Son. Right. And Jesus always refers to this, especially in the Gospel of John. Right. The father sent me, blah, blah, blah. The son's role is to take on human nature. Right. To become incarnate. And then the spirit's role is to save, sanctify, deify, etc. OK, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Yeah. So remember that role or mode is very, very important, both to triadology and Christology. That's not modalism. Modalism is a triadological heresy that unite or that that identifies all the persons. But tropos or mode is crucial to Trinitarian and Christological formulations because all mode is is talking about how a thing is. So remember that person answers the question of who, nature answers the question of what, and mode answers the question of how a thing is. So the mode of the Trinity is different in theology proper versus economia. This is why we don't we don't read economia back into Trinitarian theology proper. And the, all the modes just go back to um, right. It was created by the Father through the Son, or I forget the saying. I'm I'm new to the whole Orthodox right. So thing, so but. this is this comes from Saint Basil. Basil's dictum is from the thought, Father through the Son and in the Spirit. And that's a liturgical refrain that gets adopted and becomes kind of the norm for Trinitarian formulations uh, all the way up into St. Gregory Palamas in the, in the Middle Ages. So basically nothing in Trinitarian theology after uh, the Second Ecumenical Council, everything's pretty much settled for the East. There's a little bit of, of debate uh, in early Byzantium about uh, tr Trinitarian formulations about the offering of the Son in the liturgy. Uh, thine own of thy own. There's actually a, a early Byzantine debate about that, what that means. But aside from that, up into the Pal Trinitarian theology doesn't get debated again or stated again until the Palamite synods. And the Palamite synods uh, clarify further post Constantinople one what the meaning of the plane of hypostatic origins is, distinct from the plane of uh, energetic procession, distinct from the plane of economia. So crucial to understanding Orthodox Trinitarian theology is these three planes, P-L-A-N-E, of Trinitarian existence or reality. This is from St. Gregory Palamas. The first plane is where we begin our Trinitarian theology, hypostatic origin, the person of the Father as the sole cause. And the person of the Father is the sole cause of the generating of the Son and the spirating of the Spirit. That's the only way that we consistently, through then a relation of origins, Right, and relation of persons distinguish the Trinitarian, the hypostases of the Trinity. The second plane of, of Trinitarian theology, which is not really present in, in Roman Catholic theology, 
is energetic manifestation. We have a crucial doctrine of the energies that is necessary 100% to our Trinitarian theology. This is one of the reasons why the Tomos and the Palamite Synods of the Middle Ages reject Filioque is because we do not collapse the things that we're saying about energetic manifestation into hypostatic origin. And the Roman Catholics do that, and that's why they believe in Filioque. They don't have this level of distinction that we possess where we distinguish the eternal energetic procession or manifestation of the actions of God or the Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son in the Spirit, right? That's distinct from hypostatic origin, and it's distinct. It's related to economic proce uh, uh, procession, but it's distinct from the economia. Then we have economic procession, the third level, right, of the role of the, of the Son in creation and the role of the Holy Spirit in creation. And economia, Trinity in time and space and history and redemption, you can't read that back into uh, Trinity, Trinity proper, uh, meaning the first two layers, the first two planes. Palamas uses the phrase planes of existence in the Trinity. It's not saying that there's different Trinities. It's just making distinctions in the Trinity. By the way, that's a super stupid argument to say that uh, economia needs to perfectly reflect uh, theology right. because otherwise there wouldn't be no economy and theology. <laughs> and everything you said, like, is exactly straight from here and there. So that's from, like, the second century. Yeah, exactly, um, a good point. Also, the idea of the spirit, you know, being perfecter and stuff. This is this is very early. Yeah, I should add, it's, I, I, I didn't want to give the impression that Basil invented it. Basil just made it basically part of the liturgy. So. So, and then the filioque just undercuts all three planes that Palamas presented. That's why we know that the filioque uh, is... Uh, well, it doesn't undercut all of the three planes because most Roman Catholics at least make a distinction between theology proper and economia. But they don't understand or typically see why we make a distinction between hypostatic origin and energetic manifestation. So they will say, look, filioque... Uh, when when Basil or when John Damascus, when they talk or Athanasius, when they talk about the manifestation of the Spirit through the Son, that's no different than Filioque. It all means the same thing. No, it doesn't, because Roman Catholic theology does not have a clear energies doctrine. We do. You can see this in Athanasius. This is why I tell people ad nauseum to read the Florovsky paper on Athanasius and creation, because Florovsky shows that Athanasius teaches the essence energy distinction. And one way he does that is to distinguish between things that God does in the intra-Trinitarian life, right? Like generating a son or manifesting his glory. And those are distinct from the actions that relate to the created order, like providence or creating, right? God is not eternally provident. He's eternally provident in the sense of having the potentiality or the power but he's not eternally actualizing providence. This is, again, we go back to the modal collapse problem, right? If God is pure act, then is he eternally, purely actualizing providence? Oh, okay, well, then there's an eternal creation over which he's provident. But no, Roman Catholic actually professes that, right? So, again, it's not, it's a little more nuanced than that they're collapsing all of the three planes of existence in the Trinity into one. But they're confusing the first and second plane, and they don't see why there's a problem or why you need an energies doctrine. And they simply depart from the first seven councils because the seven councils hinge multiple arguments on the essence energy distinction. So their theology, their Trinitarian theology is all jacked up. That's the point. Perfect. Thank you so much, man. Yes, sir. Uh, what's up? We got 229. We got a nice little crowd here in the middle of the day. That's good. If you would, please hit like and share. We've got some nice little super chats here. Orthodoxy Chloroquine, $20. I love this, Jay. I just received a mandate from the, uh, yes, I won't say that, to get that uh, S-T-A-B-B-B-B-B-B-B-B-B-Y or uh, they lose their job. I'm now applying for the religious E-X-E-M-P-T-I-O-N. Um, I'm not sure they will grant it. Uh, these people are corrupt. And yes, exactly. Uh, there's not an easy answer to, you know, where we're going or what's going on. Um, so we just have to pray and be ready for, I think Father uh, Spiridon did a video about 
the coming persecutions. So I guess it's time to prepare for that. Reform Stoic. Uh oh, we got a smack talker. Your mods banned me. Uh, your mods banned me for saying that you don't have to LARP to get saved. Okay, so orthodoxy is not a LARP. So I don't know where you cooked up the idea that Orthodox Christianity is somehow uh, isomorphically identical to national churches. So this was the argument I think that you're making that uh, we have to pretend to be Serbian or Russian to be saved. Uh, that's not what orthodoxy is. Uh, those are just national expressions of the classic first thousand years of Christianity. I mean, nobody believes that you have to be a Byzantine to be saved. So, um, no, you weren't banned because of that. Uh, also, I said it doesn't matter how much the CIA handlers pay you. So, no, wait a minute. Am I a CIA ha uh, handled person or a KGB handled person? So, you need to be consistent when you're, you know, figuring out <laughs> whether I work for the CIA or the KGB, right? I mean, because it changes every few weeks. You guys say that I'm a, a KGB guy one week and a CIA guy the next week. So now, so you think it's a. So, do you see why you didn't last in the Discord? I mean, I asked you to come and debate. You, you had there were bots. A week ago saying when are you going to debate reform stoic when are you going to debate i don't even know who you are first of all um so you said what's the problem uh your mods are shook by me no these aren't arguments these are lame uh repeats of like internet gossip i mean i want you to come on here and debate can somebody unban reform stoic so that he can come on the live stream and debate he's begging for it he paid yes, th he I paid three dollars uh, but you're going to have to get better arguments than these stupid low IQ, low tier things that I'm in the CIA hey, or that we're all LARPing. Add that J to our list uh, for that popular uh, book that I'm writing. 101 fallacies that you might not have heard of, but your friends and uh, yeah, you your KGB right. every day. When you lose an argument, just call your opponent CIA, FBI, uh, KGB. But so what, what should we call it? The CIA fallacy? So you know what, 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 what's funny about these people is that they will say, you're scared to debate me, right? And then I say, I don't know who you are, but you're welcome to come to the Discord and debate. Then they come in the Discord and they spew all of the stuff that they know will get them banned. And then they say, bro, you're scared because you, you banned me. Well, no, if you had come to actually debate and not do this low IQ, stupid CIA KGB crap... Uh, you would have been able to easily debate. And I'm telling you right now, I will. we will unban you and you can come on right now. And I will let you, I'll let you have the floor. But you understand that you got to make an argument, right? Like that, those things aren't arguments. Like even if I'm the greatest spy in the history of the world, like I'm literally like above, I don't know, B James Bond. Like I tell Mike Pompeo what to do. I tell the CIA people what to do as well as telling the KGB, like literally the, the KGB, it's which, is, which has been, de long which long has long been long defunct long. for 30 years. So the KGB has been gone for 30 years, but I still tell the hidden secret KGB and the CIA what to do. But none of those things would like refute my argumentation. So like, you got to bring something better than this, dude. Uh, ref so reform stoic, if you would put in the chat here on YouTube, uh, your handle, and the, we will unban you, and then you can come on. And then I will let you, I will, I'll even give you Putin's email, dude. You can directly email Putin, and, and you can lodge your complaints to KGB headquarters directly. So I'm looking at the chat, and I'm waiting. Up, uh, mods in the chat, don't ban this guy because I, I want him to come on. Um. So while we're waiting for a reform stoic to tell us what his handle is, um, by the way, if any of the mods want to, uh, could you look and see if there's a, a, a handle that's banned called reform stoic and then we'll just unban him and he can come on and he can say whatever he wants. I just looked for a J, no sign. Okay. There's a reformed Christian apologist. That's the only one. I don't know who that is. That's probably, uh, that furry dude. If you remember, I think it was, yeah, yeah. So, no, he, he must have a different uh, Discord handle. So, as soon as he lets us know what it is, I'll unban him. Yeah. So, if you are you there? Are you there, Reform Stoke? Are you listening? You, you, you can come on and debate. We want you, we want you here. We can't get anybody to debate, so we want you here. Uh, but until he shows up, we'll move on here. Sid, three dollars. I was talking and debating with a Reformed Protestant who said that the Reformed have saints. 
Uh, no, they don't. Never heard that. Uh, that's total gibberish made up. No idea what they're talking about. I said that uh, from the example of Paul's epistles where he distinguishes saints from the community, the Protestant just said everybody who believes in saints. Everybody who believes in Christ are saints. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is just no different than, okay, so there's no difference between people in the church who are ministers because Paul says minister to one another. I mean, this is just such a, a like low low tier. Uh, yeah, but people don't know this, right? That that uh, R.C. apologist who is Roman or a reformed Christian apologist, you would, you would think he's a, a Roman Catholic. The people that ever, oh, you were so mean to him. Well, th that dude is a furry. So uh, that debate, quote unquote, that happened two years ago. I mean, that guy was just ridiculous. Um, I'm still not seeing, do you guys see him in the chat anywhere? Has he said what his discord handle is? This is so, I mean, this is so stupid and childish. Like that's literally what we get from these people. Like I always ask these people to come on and it's, you could very easily come on and you could have, I'm going to give you the floor, dude. Don't you understand that? I'll give you the floor. I'll let you say whatever you want. You could have 10, 15, 20 minutes. Make all of the reformed arguments you want. And then you come on with this bullshit that, oh, you're in the CIA, you're in the KGB. And then you wonder why you got banned. Because you're acting like an idiot, dude. That's why. Uh, let's see. Jack Gregory's for $1. Rationality Rules put out a video debunking free will. And he pointed to experiments in neuroscience. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like... Libets, libets that show that your prior brain activity before decisions. Yes. Okay, so I'll let Father Deacon respond to this. How would you respond to this, Father Deacon? That prior brain activity was uh, shown before the decision making, which proves that the deciding is already determined. Well, first of all, you have to commit to you have to pre-commit to a certain idea of right. mind-body relations. Yeah. Um, the fatal flaw with, and I won't go into all that other than that in one sense you presupp them on their prior uh, presuppositions of how mind, body, uh, the ontology of that and um, as well as causal interactions. Um, but what I would say is the fatal flaw in the experiment is the reportability. So you could actually be making a decision um, at the same time. Part of the problem is to actually separate these things out into these dual spheres. So even with materialists, like I wrote in my uh, PhD thesis, as John Searle points out, they're still committed to the exact problem that's created the mind-body problem. For them, they reject substance dualism, but embrace all the baggage of conceptual dualism that creates this whole kind of problem itself. So some of these problems are created by the way that you ask the questions or you fray, uh, you, you set up the experiment. So that would be my first critique of that. You set the experiment up in a conceptual dualistic way that causes that problem. Sort of kind of like what we see these dialectics of opposition. Why should I think that that rules out um, my free will? Um, well, you'd ha you know you'd have to set it up that way. Second, it could be also just reportability. So you're claiming to have access, and the way that that's reported, or let's say the body interactions. So what they're seeing is it seems that the body's reacting before the person says, oh, I chose to do that. Well, wait a minute. What if the person, what if it takes time where the conscious volition to actually do something to be reported to you? They don't bring that into the experiment. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of flaws with yeah. that. It doesn't prove anything. So. I don't want to go too far in depth, but that's those are the two critiques that I apply of that. There's a great uh, little clip too. Uh, I'll play this little clip from Bonson where he he has a, a great kind of classic argument refuting this. It's not very long. I'll play this just for a second here. Not thinking. 
If naturalism is true, that is, that all that exists is the natural order, and there isn't anything that goes beyond man's experience and time. If naturalism is true, then the naturalist has no reason to believe his naturalism. You write that down and I'll explain why it's true. If naturalism is true, the naturalist has no reason to believe it. Has no reason to believe it. Because to see, naturalism says all of our thinking is just electrical chemical responses. All of our thinking is subject to the laws of chemistry and physics. Which is to say, all of our thinking is determined by the factors in the physical world or in the physical brain, in the environment around us. All of our thinking is, in principle, predictable then, because it's just following the laws of nature. Uh, usually, more sophisticatedly put, the laws of physics and biology and chemistry and so forth. But the point is, human thinking is just the species of the physical world and its operation. Human thinking is just, it's on the same order, but not the same level of sophistication as weeds growing. And so if naturalism is true, then the person who's propounding it is propounding it. Why? Because his or her brain has required them by the laws of physics and chemistry and biology to say this sort of thing. It's not as though they have the freedom and self-awareness to think about different theories. Yep evaluate evidence and make a choice as to which is right or wrong so they just have to say whatever nationality they have to say. rules has refuted himself and that's why the irony is that a naturalist would promote naturalism and try to tell people it's true you should believe that and not supernaturalism the answer is if naturalism is true so that your brain is just working on the laws of physics then you have no reason to believe naturalism is true it's just the laws of physics requiring you to say that yep which is just that to say if naturalism is true, there's no reason to say that naturalism is true. Yep. Thank You're you. just forced to say that, just like I'm forced by the laws of physics to say the opposite. Thank you, Dr. Bonson, speaking to us from the grave. Uh, if naturalism's true, there's no reason to believe naturalism. <laughs> Not. So if you've ever heard the uh, Jerry Matatix greg Bonson debate, that's a classic too, by the way. Go listen to that, because Bonson pulls a knot on Matatix, right? just not <laughs> anyway yeah i mean if naturalism is true determinism is true which is what rationality rules foolishly is saying then rationality rules can't know that naturalism is true it's that easy but as we were saying uh, uh an hour ago on the discord what does psalm uh i forget which psalm it is but what does david say in the psalms the fool has said in his heart there's no god Atheism is not a rational position. It is the surrendering of rationality and it is foolishness. And that's what we do in presuppositional apologetics is that we show the atheist on his own grounds that his position is foolishness and is the surrendering of reason and rationality and logic. So I hope you guys understand that. I hope you appreciate that. Do we understand? This is what I said to JF. Do you remember the JF debate? Right. Jeff said, I'm not. Ma he says, everything is determined. I'm a cog in the machine. Oh, then you're not making arguments and your position isn't true. Thank you. The debate is over. That's why the debate with JF went the way it did, because he's just repeating this stupid argument. And again, I'm not trying to say that it's that they're stupid because they're low IQ. It's that atheism itself makes a person stupid because it is the surrendering of rationality. So this guy's very name, Rationality Rules, is ironic because atheism is irrationality ruling. Rolf Stakes, $10. The old believers argued against liturgical reforms in the Russian Orthodox Church, which were eventually accepted. So are liturgical reforms that are acceptable? So the they were arguing over minor things, whether you do two fingers or one finger. Okay, that's that, that's not essential to the faith. And a lot of the old believers, and even if the patriot was corrupt, I mean, most of those people have been re reconciled to the church anyway. So we have to be careful when it comes to liturgical reforms that we aren't mistaking the, uh, the non-apostolic traditions for uh, cultural peculiarities and traditions, right? 
I mean, Greeks have things that they do that are unique to the Greeks. Serbians do things unique to Serbians, okay? Those things are not identical to the apostolic deposit. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things, having cultural national traditions, but they can be in, in, inducements to uh, prelest or to pride or to, oh, our Greek traditions are far superior to the Russian tradition, you know, this kind of stuff, right? That's the wrong attitude. Um, and the things that the old believers were sort of obsessing over, even though it's, it's similar to what we get in the radical uh, so-called true orthodox, right? So just because you identify a problem doesn't mean that you have the right reaction to that problem, right? It's possible to have a wrong reaction to a real problem. Does that make sense? So in the same way, we can liken today's schismatic so-called true orthodox to the um, overzealous attachment to incidentals or theologumena that the old uh, that the uh, old believers had. So no, I would not equate uh, quote liturgical reform. There are many been many periods in the church. Basil did a lot of liturgical reform, and some of the people that got mad at Saint Basil were mad at him because. He put things in the liturgy to back up his theological positions. And people said, ah, oh, you're, a, you're a liberal, you're a... No, I mean, he was just bolstering the point that the Holy Spirit is fully divine. So, again, I, I'm not a liturgist. That's not my domain. Uh, Father Deacon, you would probably speak to this a lot better than me, or Sneck, to aspects or things in the liturgy that are not identical to the apostolic deposit. Father Deacon, are you there? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's things that can be developed. Um, that's not we're not antiquarians. Uh, again, the structure, you know, some some of the earliest liturgies is described by Saint Justin Martyr in 150 A.D. Uh, that pattern, the like, if you look at the different liturgies like St. Basil, St. Gregory, St. John Chrysostom, and uh, St. James, what you'll see is the, what's the, the template's exactly the same, uh, right? The same structure, prayers are added and different things like that. Uh, the introducing of iconostasis, uh, later, um, all that's fine. I don't see why that's a problem. Um, it reflects the pattern of the liturgy going on in heaven, the worship in heaven, and it's theologically sound. How that develops, I don't. I don't see why that would be an issue. They're not liturgical reforms, like huge, problematic. They're things that actually make sense. So we can have a type of development. That doesn't mean that we're Henry Newman doctrine development. Right. Uh, Snack, do you want to add anything onto that? So I really don't see why that would be. And also uh, a continuity with the liturgical worship of the ancient Hebrews too. And as Jay and I have argued too, only the Orthodox can coherently uh, give an account for the continuity between Old Testament and New Testament from the ancient Hebrew Israelites and the church. Okay, so is somebody saying, are you saying uh, Stoic wins is reform Stoic? He's in the chat now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's him, yeah, that's Stoic, Stoic wins, yeah. We do have a Muslim who said they asked to go soon. He had two quick questions he wanted to ask if we have time for that. Okay, we'll do the yeah. Muslim and then we'll do uh, Reform Stoic, who's ready here to expose us all as KGB. So uh, go ahead, Mr. Muslim. That's Fred, Fred Douglas. Yeah. A Muslim uh, named Frederick okay. Douglas. My question is real quick. Just can you come to the conclusion that God, a God exists without using the Bible? That's one of my questions. Uh in one sense, we would say that there is an inner uh, intuitive sense that all men have, according to Romans 1, in their heart of hearts or their noose, that there is a God and that we have offended against him and that we're guilty because we have the law of God on our heart. 
So that's what I think Paul is saying in Romans 1. But if you mean uh, through rational deduction of looking at the natural world, do we do this uh, natural theology exercise to getting back to a first cause? Uh, some people might do that, but whether they can give an account for that is a different question, and I don't think they can. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is, can you gain salvation without full, full knowledge of the Trinity in this day and age? Well, we don't believe that, quote, full knowledge of the Trinity is a uh, purely rational exercise. So it's not like uh, you got to go get a THD to be saved because, you know, we believe that there's infants who are going to be saved. Right. And this is partly why we baptize infants. Um, and we don't think that everybody who is in the church has to attain, you know, a high level of intellectual capacity to be saved. I mean, you can have slow boys that get saved. I'm sure there will be plenty of slow boys who are saved and plenty of uh, theologians who are damned. So um, there is, at least from God's perspective, I mean, and God knows this, you know, some degree of knowledge that is applicable to to whom uh, much is given, much is required, is, is what the way I would put it. So when Jesus is asked this question in the Gospels, he kind of says, to the degree that you have been gifted, that is the degree to which you will have, uh, you know, you will be judged on the basis of that requirement. Does that make sense? Yeah, and just uh, thank you for your answers. Sure. Just the uh, last question. Sure. Um, why won't you debate Jake, the Muslim metaphysician? So uh, we had everything set up with Jake to do a debate, and Jake would not accept the terms that we always do with everybody. And he did that because he didn't want a cross-examination where he would be pinned down. And so he said that you have to change your cross-examination to where any question you ask, I get... Uh, no interruptions in one to two minutes to reply. And also, uh, Jake, I don't think, I think he was disingenuous in the last six or eight months in the Discord to where, you know, we let him in here. We, we talked to him for many nights, many hours. And all he was doing was getting reconnaissance to try to build an apologetic. So he kind of approached us in a disingenuous way that he was, oh, well, I'm interested in Orthodox. I'd love to. But it wasn't, he wasn't interested. He was just trying to understand get reconnaissance to have a better apologetic. So uh, if he had been more uh, forthright in like his purpose and what he was out to do, and if he hadn't been uh, such a bitch about the way that we do our debates, which nobody else has a problem with, nobody else demands that the criteria of the debate have to be changed to him. And if he hadn't done um, a bunch of lame expose videos calling me out, I probably would have done it. But now I don't have any interest in interacting with him. He's also a um, heretic. Yeah, he won't. He, much any standard Sunni Orthodox. Yeah, he doesn't. Uh, he won't state his position. Schools. Yeah, he just states he won't state his school. So he kind of like plays this snaky thing where he can like adopt any Islamic school that he wants. So which you're not supposed to do. So so that's why. And the other thing I've noticed with the Islamic apologists is that. They do this thing where it's like every time you debate one of them and the debate goes bad for them, they do this thing where they say, well, you haven't debated our real dude. And that's a that's going to go on ad nauseum. Like you're, you can debate every Muslim apologist. They will get destroyed in every debate. And they're still going to just turn around and say, yeah, but you haven't really debated our best guy, which is some other guy in the middle of nowhere, right? Oh, there's a there's a sheikh in Jordan that you haven't debated who's best friends with the king of Jordan. And once you debate that guy, then maybe you'll know real Islam. Right. So it's it's like the, you know, it's like the the Marxists or the libertarians like it's never really been tried. You've never really debated. <laughs> it's like, well, at what point is it a real debate with with, you know, an actual Muslim? Right. Because Shabir Ali. Oh, he's not. He's not a real Muslim. Sheikh Azar Rashid. Oh, he's not the real guy to debate. Right. And so it's just it's never going to end. There's never going to be the actual Muslim that, you, that you're supposed to debate. So anyway, that's why there's no point. What's the point? Uh, is reform stoic in the house? I'm scared, dude. I'm, sh I'm literally sh shaking, dude. Reform stoic. Reform Stoic, this is what you wanted. Hello? Stoic, Stoic wins, are you there? We can see you there. You've got your mic unmuted. 
They've even let you in without asking for a profile pic. You know. Don't get the mic. Here we go. My mic's broken. Our Discord has the amazing power to completely obliterate every microphone. Have you noticed that? Literally nobody's microphone works in our Discord. And it, it's, it's purely a touch. Uh-oh. You're here? You're here. Let's go! Let's get it, Jay. Hey, I'm a big fan, by the way, first of all. Oh, yeah, I'll bet you are. Sure. And second of all, I never said anything about KGB. I just said CIA, bro. Yeah, that was... you're trying to group me in with other people. I'm a, I'm a lone wolf. That was wolf my, gang. That was my joke. You ever heard of Intrepid Corp? Lance Cottrell? I exposed them on my channel, man. He was dressed up like a mailman in my neighborhood. Isn't that nuts? All right. Are you a troll? Are you are you a troll? Or are you here to debate? <laughs> well, remember, you remember? Um, I don't know. I have no idea who you're talking. Right? I don't know so who you. you I don't know debate. who you are. I don't know what you're talking about. You you can have so the Southern Israelite. Well, you and Southern Israelite debated, correct? You do remember that, right? Uh, yeah. No. Okay. Well, I exposed him as a. CIA I, I don't care who you've exposed. Do, do you have a topic to the, do? Nobody cares on. about your I channel and your. Nobody cares about your channel and your exposés. Do you have an argument? Well, that's not an argument. That's the deflection. Do you yet. have an argument? Let's talk about CIA handlers, Jay. My argument is that you have CIA handlers. Okay, and, and where ironic. is the what proof? Where about? is the proof of this? You talk about people giving like a little bit of information and not really giving anything relevant to right now. That's exactly what your channel does, Jay. Okay, so how is that a proof? That it. how is that a proof? Let's get it. Well, you, well, here's a proof. You do not have to be orthodox to get saved. That's for sure. You just got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay, this guy is a fad or a buddy. troll. This like, guy's not even... Let's just, this guy is a troll. Just delete this guy. It's a total waste I'm, of time. I'm a John 316 Christian, Jay. Let's get He's it. laughing because he knows that what he's saying is disingenuous. Is He can't even make an argument. It's a total waste of time. So there you go. That's the quality. The quality of our opponents is so low tier. That all he can do is like, I don't even know what that was. Okay. Fed speak? Like, what was that? Did anybody hear what church he was in? I'm, 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 He's I'm probably not even convinced. in a church, dude. That's probably he's not, not even. He's not part of a <laughs> Total church, clown. No, he said uh, in my DMs, he said he's invisible church. Yeah, yeah, so I just so the Protestant role. <laughs> just, uh, just a Man. total clown. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, anybody have any good uh, actual arguments or positions that they want to put forward? We got a couple super chats. Bantu says. I just have a question. Um, yeah. You know how you said there was a debate over thine own of thine own. Uh huh. Could you say what the position was settled on? What that means? I brought it up with uh, Seraphim. It's like the end of the the second chapter in Mindorf. So uh, it's kind of a confusing thing. I'll get the book here in a second, but. Do you guys want to take over? I'm going to run to the little boys' room. So maybe we should just explain to people what that is. There's a part in the liturgy um, where the priest or the deacon holds up the chalice and plate, holy plate. Um, it says, thine own of thine own. We offer to thee. Are you guys familiar with that part? On behalf of all and for all. Yeah, and all. Mm. What's the? But I'm not familiar about like what the. I have the mind or book, but what the debate is over. Lewis, you know. Um, no, but, um, I've always found it kind of like you could interpret that in so many different ways. Like it could just be about the elements, um, but it could also be about Christ. Like, so the son being the father's own being offered to the father, that's probably what they settled on, but it's, yeah, it's kind of like, it, it's kind of ambiguous. So I wanted to know what the you settled mean, view was uh, elements as far as the brand or like I got it right here. So there's yeah, a, yeah, as in like it's God's creation that we're offering back to Him, kind of thing. Like that's that's the other thought I had. Maybe well, it's that's a, what it means. It's, it's Does it have to be an either or too. It's the offering of the no, of the Son. So 
let me here here's the debate and you'll see how it applies to refuting the protestant uh, purely juridical notion so it's uh pages 39 and 40 of um the mindorf book so uh let me read this it gets a little confusing so let's see if we can parse this out he says the very Kirillian uh, conclusion of the council against Eustrasius led to further Christological debates, which this time concerned the meaning of the Eucharistic sacrifice. The deacon uh, Soterikos Pantuginos, the patriarch elect of Antioch, affirmed that the sacrifice could not be offered to the Holy Trinity, for this would imply that, one, uh, that the one Christ performs two opposing actions the human action of offering, the divine action of receiving. And this would mean an Nestorian separation and personalization of two natures. Okay, so we got that point that far, right? Interesting. And then it goes on to say, um, where did I leave off? Nicholas, the bishop of Methone in Peloponnese, was a major Byzantine theologian of the 12th century, and he responded to Stotirikos with an elaboration on the notion of hypostasis based on uh, Leontius of Byzantium and Maximus the Confessor. The hypostatic union is precisely what permits one to consider God as performing humanly uh, the act of offering while maintaining that God by nature and therefore receiving the, the sacrifice. To Soterikos, Nicholas opposed the conclusion of the prayer of the Cherubicon, whose author, as modern research shows, is none other than Cyril of Alexandria himself. But what is part of both Byzantine liturgies uh, and uh, attributed to Basil and Chrysostom is the words, For it is thou who offerest and who art offered, who receivest and art thyself received. Nicholas, whose views were endorsed by the Council of 1156-57, to shows that neither the Eucharist nor the work of Christ in general can be reduced to a purely juridical notion of sacrifice conceived as an exchange. God does not have to receive anything from us. We do not go to him to make an offering. Rather, he condescends towards us, assumes our nature, not as a condition of reconciliation, but in order to meet us openly in the flesh. Thus, you can see how this refutes the Protestant doctrine of the juridical, purely juridical uh, 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 transaction. Does that make sense? It's quite complicated, I must say, you were right. Uh, and then it goes on to say, the very technical Christological discuss discussions of the 12th century uh, reconsider all the major issues which have been debated in the 5th and 6th and 7th. The Byzantine Church remained fundamentally faithful to what Father Florovsky calls asymmetrical Christology, the union of God and man in Christ. The, hypostas the hypostatic source of all life is divine. The mankind is not diminished, diminished, but in fact becomes fully human. The notion of asymmetrical Christology is thus expressed in the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is a unique act in which no single action of Christ is represented in isolation or reduced to any purely human concepts, such as a, jurid, a purely juridical, he's saying, exchange or satisfaction. Christ, as the Synodicon says every Sunday of Orthodoxy, reconciles us to himself by means of the whole mystery of the economy, by himself, in himself, and thus reconciles us to his God and Father, and of course to the most holy, life-giving Spirit. So in other words, there's no sense at all in which there's a human subject that is offering something to the Son or to the Trinity. That's the key here. In other words, this dispute is a further reaffirmation of asymmetrical Christology, that Christ is a divine hypostasis, and there's no human subject that is part of this transaction and change and offering. The humanity is the humanity of the divine person of the word that he offers to the Father, you see. Does that make sense? So they sided with the first um, Antiochian deacon uh, that it's not referring to offering to the whole Trinity. Is that right? Let me rephrase. Let me restate that part. Uh, it's a deacon. Yeah, deacon Sotirikos, 
who affirmed that sacrifice could not be offered to the Trinity, for this would imply that the one Christ performs two opposing actions, a human action of offering and a divine action of receiving, and this would be Nestorian. Uh, but the response is that the hypostatic union is precisely what permits one to consider God as performing humanly the action of offering. So it's that he entered into the mode of humanity. It's not a human person offering, it's the divine son offering the humanity. Does that make sense? So in other words, he is the offerer and the receiver. It's in the Synodicon as well, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's why it cites the Synodicon of saying that he proclaims that Christ reconciles us to himself by means of the whole mystery of the economia, by himself, in himself, to his God and our Father and to the Spirit. Oh yeah, because it's an hypostaton in, yeah, in him, in right. a unique mode. Exactly. So this is where mode becomes crucial, but if you look at it, this was the point I was making to uh, um, to Seraphim Hamilton in our discussion, which is that even the liturgy, if you were to follow it out, the theology of the liturgy, you would see that it refutes the, the Protestant reductionist notion of making it a, ju a juridical, theoretical bank account transaction. It's impossible with correct Trinitarian theology to have that view. That's the point here. Perfect, thanks. Yes, sir. Let's see, we got a couple more super chats here. Uh, Bantu, uh, one dollar. What is the orthodox doctrine of recapitulation and why is it so important? And can it be pr proven through scripture? Here are some KGB Dugan bucks. Thank you. Um, so recapitulation is taught in Paul, it's taught in Colossians, it's taught in Ephesians, and it's taught in Corinthians. When Paul says that um, in all Adam die, and so all in Christ will be made alive, that is the doctrine of recapitulation, that all men are, the general resurrection itself is predicated on recapitulation. It wouldn't even be possible if there weren't a recapitulation of all human nature via the divine person of the Logos, assuming universal human nature. This is the teaching of all the Eastern Fathers in the first seven councils, and it's crucial to the seventh council. St. Theodore the Studite says many times in his book on the Holy Icons that the whole premise of iconography is that Christ is the archetype of humanity because he assumed universal human nature. He says it over and over and over, and he's just restating what Athanasius and St. Cyril taught. So that's, cru that's key to our doctrine, and in fact, uh, Aquinas departs from this, uh, I believe. I don't believe Aquinas is consistent on this point. He teaches, for example, that Christ's humanity is just a single substance. It's a single fully human nature, but it is not inherently or mystically or universally connected to all human beings. That's a key departure, and it's not just Aquinas. I don't think Augustine clearly teaches this. I don't think Anselm teaches it. It's a point of departure in the West early on. So there's no recapitulation doctrine, but recapitulation is fundamental to Irenaeus. Irenaeus has a whole section in Against Heresies on recapitulation, where he says that the, the son assumed and restored everything that Adam lost, everything. This is why the, re the reprobate are resurrected. It's fundamental. It's not even up for debate. None of the Eastern Fathers debate or dispute this. It's, it's not even an issue. But when you get to Augustine's theology, where you have a, it's not Calvinism, but he does have an unconditional election doctrine, the consequence of that is the limitation of the scope of Christ's assumption of human nature and atonement and redemption. Now, Augustine doesn't believe in limited atonement, but what he does believe is that the efficaciousness of salvation only ultimately applies to the predestined fixed number of the elect. So the consequence of that, obviously, is that it limits the scope to where it's no longer a cosmic scope of redemption. But as you guys know, right, can somebody mute, please? The cosmic scope of redemption is fundamental to Maximus, fundamental to Athanasius, fundamental to everything in Eastern Orthodox theology. Fundamental. Again, it's in Irenaeus. There's a whole section. And against heresies on recapitulation. So it, this is a big uh, departure point between East and West. And so that's why it's so important is that it's, it's just there's no way to have 
correct Christology, correct redemptive theology without recapitulation. And Protestants, when they hear this, the first thing they say is, oh, so everybody's saved. Oh, you're teaching everybody's saved. No, this is the mistake of David Bentley Hart. David Bentley Hart thinks that recapitulation means the restoration of universal human nature necessitates every individual hypostasis also being saved. No, it does not. Every individual hypostasis will be judged on the basis of how they acted with their will, their mode of willing, which is hypostatic, using that nature. So David Bentley Hart collapses person into nature, and that's his mistake. David, the mural medwite, did a whole video a year ago just pointing out this simple, basic mistake. That's the, that's the error of David Bentley Hart, is that he doesn't understand the distinction between nature and person not just in the Trinity, but also in humans. So you're not judged on the basis of universal human nature. Universal human nature is restored. Everybody, even the reprobate, will be resurrected. But how you as an individual will experience that resurrection, forever well-being or ever ill-being, will depend on how you used your nature and your will in this life to love God or to rebel against God. It's that simple. So yes, and thank you guys. KGB class is really good, isn't it? Everybody loves KGB class, right? We'll be getting to uh, assassinations uh, and sexual compromise operations in part two of this lecture. I'm joking. That's a joke, by the way. Um, who's next? Anybody else? Open chat. By yeah, the way, did, I have a question. did you guys hear when Seraphim Hamilton was on and we were... He said exactly what you hear me say for all these years. He said this very thing. He said that even though nature is restored, we will be judged on the basis of how each individual hypostasis utilizes that nature. That's the personal hypostatic mode of willing. What have I told you guys for years now? So again, you're not, I don't, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just repeating what Maximus and the Eastern Fathers say. It's that simple. Go ahead. Who's next? Uh, it's me. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm a Muslim, by the way. So, what? My, I interacted mainly with Orientals on this call, so they might, like I might get a different answer from you. But uh, would you say that being uncaused is a property of the essence or the Father or the? Uh, it's a hypostatic property. The mm, fa the yeah. Father is uh, uncaused. I, yeah, I think this is a. Uh, a better position than what I've heard from Orientals. Yeah, well, Oriental I theology think, is jacked up, so yeah. Because it would sort of imply contradiction. The, the sun cannot be both uncaused and caused, you know, begotten. Correct. He is not autotheos, right? He is of the Father. And the original Nicene Creed and Nicene teaching is that he is divine because he has begotten yeah also another question do you affirm uh, that god has one act no the only time that that's you it's used by saint maximus and it's used by john damascus and maximus is very clear in the two in the, the, the uh, 200 chapters that the only time that we say god is quote pure act is in contrast to creatures in himself, in his essence, in the inner Trinitarian life, God is not pure act. He's clear as day. The first five pages of the 200 chapters says this. And John Damascus is not saying anything different. And again, I, I did a whole talk in Montana on the absurdities of saying that God is pure act in himself. Uh, okay. Uh, can you, uh, which video in particular? Because I want to watch it. The lecture in Montana. Okay, I'm going to watch. So it's anyway. Thanks for. Uh, it's available uh, for purchase through Jay's. So you, you can watch the first half. It's oh, that's right, that's right. First half. Uh, it's called Roman Catholicism, Islam, and Greek philosophical presuppositions. Montana, Montana lecture, Jay Dyer. So it's like I don't know, five or six videos back. Thank you for the response. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. Pacific Pacific Samizda, forty dollars. Thanks, bro. Debate debate Mohammedan bin Salman. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we've gone through one, two, three, four. We've done. We've debated four Muslims, and of course, 
every time you debate, oh, you didn't debate the real guy. So I'm sure that there's an infinite supply like dominoes of an infinite domino chain of the real Muslims. So there's, there, there's no final boss. It's like Donkey Kong, right? Donkey Kong has no end. Like you get to the end of Donkey Kong, it just starts over, right? Or Duck Hunt or something. I don't know. Islamic apologetics is like Duck Hunt or Donkey Kong. It never ends. There's no final boss. And maybe it's structured that way. Like, so you can never win. You can never be a final boss. <laughs> Uh, so, but thank you for that. Uh, I don't know who Mohammed bin Salman is. I've lost track of all these people. Uh, I'm sure that, so Lewis and, um, uh, Sarah from Hamilton and, and Kai, I'm sure that they can, uh, engineer the next, uh, final boss of Muslims. Vampire Frog, $5. If you debate the King of Jordan and you win, by the way, the King of Jordan is an open CIA so He's been for many years. So there's a old Time Magazine articles about the CIA just buying off whoever the, the latest King of Jordan is. But thank you. I will debate the King of Jordan and I will win. Uh, what can I be your prime minister or the court jester? Well, I will uh, be the court jester and the emperor at the same time when I debate the King of Jordan. So I'm sorry, you can't have that vampire frog. Wabongo, $5. Why does God uh, ban that? And then, well, so yeah, we're not going to answer that question. So you can come to the Discord and you can uh, deal, you know that we can't deal with those questions on this platform. So maybe in the Discord you can uh, find somebody who would be glad to discuss those topics with you. But I think you could probably figure out why. Bantu, $1.20. Let's hypothetically assume that Spurgatron 3000 can be stoic. I know this person is CIA, but KGB agent. Double duality of the eternal Audis. Be weary, Jay. Well, most of the time, the people that are like constantly calling people feds are feds. <laughs> I mean, that's like fed, fed, red flag, fed flag number one, right? <laughs> is the guy who's always calling everybody else a fed is usually some kind of fed. Um, but that guy, I mean, I don't even know who that guy is. So he just wants to be uh, important. And like, he's coming on like the first, he doesn't even present an argument. He's like, you know, I called out so-and-so on my channel. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> so what? Uh, Welcome everybody. By the way, uh, we got on, we got almost three hundred in the middle of the day. That's nice. If you would hit like and share, and uh, anybody in the chat, we still got a full house in the chat. Hello, Discord. Hello, hello. Is there anybody in there? <laughs> Just not if you can hear me. Hey, Jay. Uh huh. My name is Odin Benitez, and uh, I just this isn't a challenge or anything. I just want to thank you for uh, really kind of uh, bringing me to orthodoxy. I'm in the in the process of doing it. I was uh, I'm a supervising sound editor in Hollywood, and I've been working in the industry for 30 years. Um, I may have some insights, um, and uh, you know, into Hollywood and and you know their ideology. Oh, interesting. Um, cool. Yeah, it's like, I mean, the whole, you know, everybody kind of grows up with this. It's just, it's a huge echo chamber. Um, but I, I'm sort of like you. I, I was baptized Catholic. I went to a Baptist high school, um, went to college, became a liberal Christian, mm -hmm. got introduced to Gnosticism, was really fascinated by that, by the Gospel of Thomas, and read a bunch of books until I realized it was uh, Satanism, basically. Right. And uh, I kind of went back then to Roman Catholicism just because I did a lot of investigation on uh, the historical Jesus. And, um, and I thought that the, that the Catholic scholars were, were the best up at that point. But I wasn't really introduced to any of the Eastern fathers. And it's really odd because I did a lot of studying of uh, Byzantium because I wrote a script about the fall of uh, Constantinople. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I read like four different contemporary accounts. Um, and I read all of the John Julius Norwich books. The, the interesting thing is, though, that I never was really exposed to any of the theology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even, uh, I think even, even Norwich just said something along the lines about, I don't, he didn't really understand what the difference is between orthodoxy and catholicism is something sure. about the energies of christ <laughs> yeah and uh <laughs> you know 
And uh, so I, I, so for me, this is really illuminating because I'm somewhat of a amateur scholar about uh, Byzantium. I, I even wrote two chapters in a military history book about some battles um, uh, that uh, that occurred with the Byzantine Empire. Awesome, that's crazy. Yeah, which is, yeah. So I, it's so for me, this is sort of like it's almost like providence. You know, I've been I've studied so much of uh, the Byzantine history, never really understanding the theology, and it's so I'm making my way through Byzantine theology. That book. Um, and um, also uh, uh, some Father Seraphim books, uh, Red Nihilism, which is just, it was like, it, it's a short book, but it took me forever to get through because each sentence is so thought provoking. Um, but I just wanted to thank you. And, and I'm, you know, I've, I've uh, found a, a church out here and I'm in the process of, uh, you know, once I get through this business theology, I want to contact the priest. And I've been to Vespers already. Awesome. Yeah, that's great to hear. I know that. Uh... We are in the process right now of converting Hugh Jackman, uh, Mel Gibson. No, I'm joking. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, I mean. You know what? My, no, my, my, uh, my cousin actually drove with, uh, he was Mel Gibson's driver. And, you know, before the whole thing, the, his idea about the resurrection, that uh, he and Mel were partying and Mel got kind of close to him and said, you know, I've got this idea about making a movie about the resurrection. I think that's the next film. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward but, to that. Yeah, I think that's going to be a good movie. You know, to convert him, he's he's a what is a pre-Vatican or is a Vatican one Catholic? I think. Uh, well, he's a set of a contest, yeah. Right. Right. So yeah, and they're the they're the they're the we, we are the original set of a contest as Orthodox. So maybe uh, eventually we can convert Mel Gibson. So pray for the conversion of Mel Gibson. But yeah, I think yeah. the the <laughs> resurrection movie oh. does sound like a good idea. I was bummed to hear so him and. Um, Mark Wahlberg are doing uh, a movie about a Roman Catholic priest in my town. And I was like, this is my chance. Because, uh, you know, my cassock just gets me into anything. I just introduced myself. Then I found out they're filming. They're not filming in Montana. They're not oh. even going to be up there. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's so I know I could have got them. Well, you, you know, I, I still have another contact in, in addition to my cousin. There's another co-worker who actually works for him as his assistant. So, you know, there is a chance. <laughs> Tell him I'm looking for him. On I will. <laughs> is there a problem? Your car didn't work. Oh, where are we at? If you would uh, like and share it, we got a 333 Dimitros. He says... In the Orthodox tradition, or in your perspective, does Orthodoxy have much to say about uh, per-marital, I think you meant premarital relations? Is that a sin? Why? I just came back to Orthodoxy after being Buddhist for a decade. I live with my girlfriend. So technically, yes, that is not the way that we uh, should approach marriage and marital relations. And uh, I would say that the way that you would go about figuring out the best approach to what with, in terms of what to do with the girlfriend that you live with is to talk to your spiritual father and advisor and he will probably give you the best advice when you if you do come into orthodoxy as to how to handle that and uh, I would say that probably during the catechumenate period he will I mean I don't know but he will probably ask that you you know maybe find a, a separate apartments or something like that so typically yeah we don't we don't uh, do that so hopefully that answers the question but um ethical personal questions we don't typically tell people what to do because that's more so the domain of you and your spiritual father and my role is not as an ethical uh spiritual guide i'm not a guru i don't run a cult uh and we direct people in the discord to clergy so i'm not a clergy I, i'm not there to handle the niceties and the the tell you exactly what you should do with your girlfriend um, but i would say that no typical orthodoxy does not uh, it frowns on living with your girlfriend warhammer five dollars uh, officer jack shields is a gnostic geokamai i don't know who that is he his cats drums uh i've done a video exposing I don't know who, what you're talking about. Okay, so I mean, I appreciate you. I, I think this is something to do with that guy's expose videos. We don't waste our time with a bunch of, I'm going to expose you, bro. Or 
Right. I mean, exposed videos literally go nowhere. I mean, nobody even remembers the exposed. I remember like five years ago, all the people that were making exposed videos. Nobody even remembers those people. Their channels are all gone. Nobody's going to care about your exposed uh, videos in a month. They literally get forgotten. Nobody cares, dude. So uh, thank you for that super chat. But I have no idea who these people are. So don't, don't. But, but and yeah, most of the time, the people that are making the exposed videos uh, are themselves feds. I mean, the, the number one sign of a fed is everybody else is a fed. That's, that's all they do is make the exposed videos. So that's red flag number one. Fed flag number one. Exposed, debunked. Um, anybody else? We got a uh, full room here. Open chat. Yeah, Jay, how's it going, bro? Uh oh. I'm gonna. Uh oh, here we I, go. No. Oh, it's Dustin, dude. Oh, hey, what's up, dude? <laughs> you had that tone of like, you had that tone it's of Dustin. like, you had that, to- oh, yeah. you had that tone of hey. like, I love you, but I hate you, right? Like, I'm about to destroy you, dude. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roast you, Jay. You I love you, debate. and I love you your content, your but. Like, let me explain why you're the worst human being on the planet right now. It's like, uh, you know, you could win debates, Jay, if you could figure out your boomer tech and unmute your mic. Ooh, <laughs> roasted, yeah. bro. Burn. Roast. Anyways, uh, this actually, this question is from uh, Zhao. Um, he says, how would you refute postmodernist thinkers like Umberto Eco? And Derrida, and their theories of semiotics. Oops, theories of semiotics against metaphysics. I did a whole video on uh, Echo, uh, and Echo has a whole essay where he basically argues that the the goal of the true leftist, and he's speaking in a general sense of like classical, what he sees as. The history of all leftism, he says, it's not a battle of liberals against a fascist regime. He says that the real battle and goal of the leftist is against truth, which is fascism in essence. So any notion that there's truth, Echo says, is fascism. And he says that's the real battle of the liberal is against truth itself. Can't make this up. That's it's a famous essay. Uh, it's like the Ur fascist or the something like that by Echo. Uh, I highly recommend reading that essay because it really gives you an insight into the mindset of a person who was a committed rabid Thomist, who at some point in college or when it was I don't know, grad school he realized that Thomism doesn't work. Thomism is a broken, dead end system, and instead of going towards orthodoxy or something like that. Uh, Echo said, no, I'm going to be like the uber liberal. I'm going to go the demon satanic route, L- like literal Satanism. I mean, I, I think Echo was probably a, uh, like totally into Luciferian. Sat- I mean, I've read most of his books, so I, I'm not saying this out of speculation. I mean, he fills his books with Gnostic, Satanic, Luciferian, esoteric themes, especially if you read Foucault's Pendulum. He's basically defending the idea of, you know, a satanic elite more or less. And ultimately, of course, he's critiquing all of these things, he says, too, like, oh, you know, the idea of any kind of elite is absurd. So he kind of adopts this nihilistic, absurdist view that whether you're a Christian who believes in truth or whether you're this sort of Luciferian, Gnostic, Kabbalist, elitist, it's all absurdity. It's all nihilism. It's all just nothing. So you you could read his books in that way uh, as, as if it's like cosmic nihilism. Maybe he's like that final stage of Father Seraphim Rose's book on nihilism. But regardless, uh, Echo is a great example of um, the mature, spiritually, like dark, I'm saying darkly matured, like self-conscious evil that is like our battle is against truth itself. Any notion that there's such a thing as truth is the real battle of the liberal. So you get that rare honesty in Umberto Eco's famous essay. So when we understand that that's the real uh, motivation of a Derrida, of a uh, Foucault, of a Eco, of uh, uh, the, the deconstructionist, now we understand that that's, that's really what's going on here. And quite obviously, it's self-refuting. I mean, why are we, we're writing books using words and meaning to say books and words have no meaning. 
It's just fundamentally stupid. And they're okay with that, right? So postmodernists are okay with accepting nonsense, contradictions. There's no grand narratives. Okay, but that's a grand narrative. Okay, and if we're, if we're accepting contradictions and nonsense and chaos and meaninglessness, then you can't make arguments that nonsense and chaos and meaninglessness is true. So you've done your job as an apologist. And at a certain point, there's nothing that you can do with people like that. Like you can't, if people are self-consciously, willfully wanting that level of evil, uh, all you can do is pray for their repentance. I mean, there's like, that's self conscious evil right so I, I hope that answers the question about echo anybody else hey jay i have a question um sure when Filofsky talks about separated brethren um about wait, wait, the who, Protestants, who who Filofsky. okay um and I wonder what you think about that and what, what does that mean with relation to, you know, heterodox or people outside the church? Right. So sometimes that word is used. I don't think it's necessarily always wrong. I mean, because you can have people who uh, don't know all the issues, right? I mean, who aren't um, hardened in their heresy. They're not formal heretics, right? So I do agree that there is a, a, a patristic idea of somebody who... Um, is not a formal heretic, but is a uh, material heretic, a heretic in potentia, you could say. And that's because heresy is usually defined as not a sin of just merely being wrong, but a sin of obstinacy. So a heretic is not somebody just, just wrong, because we're all wrong, right? So are we all heretics? Because I'm sure everybody's got some point in their theology wrong, right? So, but the sin of heresy and the sin of schism are sins of obstinacy, will, and knowledge. So you're knowingly, obstinately persisting in the error, in the heresy. Um, there's not a, you know, always a clear cut, like black and white in terms of every individual when a person's obstinately a heretic. So what we do from our vantage point is we don't try to go, you know, person by person making specific judgments. We just do a judgment call on the group as a whole and there's nothing wrong with that because we're not condemning everybody as if we know their inner state or their heart but what we do know is that at least before the end of a person's life they have to be orthodox they have to believe and be united to the orthodox faith so if god somehow makes up for that if god gives them a special means at the point of death or something like that we don't know but our job our job our duty just like infants who die without baptism or outside the church, do we know that they go to hell? No. Uh, we simply commend them to God, and we don't know their total end fate. But our job is to tell them and call them to orthodoxy. So uh, the at the time when the phrase separated brethren was used at Florence, that's used by St. Mark of Ephesus at the beginning of the council. There's a great uh, article over at Orthodox Ethos, that points out that by the end of the council, St. Mark of Ephesus realized that they're not separated brethren. They're heterodox. And you get the exact same expression in St. Gregory Palamas. He says that the Latins are heterodox. They listen to Satan. They're wrong. They're heresy. They're in heresy. But that doesn't mean that we have to go by every single person one by one and say, you're a damned heretic, you're a damned heretic, you're a damned heretic. We don't have to do that because it's not our job to judge every individual person. It's rather a collective public judgment that we make about what they profess to believe, which is in error and is heresy. And if and, and God will deal with them on an individual level. We don't have to do that. That's why Paul says, what have we to do with judging those who are without? We judge those within. So it's much more pertinent to us to assess in the Orthodox Church who is and isn't Orthodox. We don't have, we're not, it's not, we don't have to worry about what does Brother Billy Bob believe? What does Michael Lofton believe? What does so they're they're heterodox and God will deal with them. We don't have to. But right, it's so but it's, 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 but it's important to point out that ecumenists misuse the phrase separated brethren because after the council, St. Mark of Ephesus says they are not any more separated brethren. They are obstinate Latins and they're stupid and they're in heresy. Okay, so like whoever, so God deals with um, each person according to what they've been given. And so if they haven't had the full revelation, the full truth, like God will, you know, 
lead them into truth at all possible means and we don't have to worry about that um that's what i would say but we do have the duty right but it's just like like evangelism right like we have the duty to tell people that you have to you know come into the church repent and believe uh, baptize all the nations right as jesus says the great commission um now we're not told like what happens to people that die that never hear the gospel we don't know i mean we're not told that what we know is what we're told to do that's all we know i don't know and one thing that is i think orthodoxy helps you accept as you get older is uh that there's a reason why god doesn't tell us everything so i'm perfectly fine with like i don't know (laughs) what happens to the guy who dies in you know the pagan island who never heard the gospel well i mean unless god has a special means by which he joins that person to the church at the point of death or something like that i mean then we don't know we're not told but what we are told is that we have to preach and tell them to come into the kingdom okay great thank you sure and we also have to be careful too of the the excess there's a balance that's struck here and we see it in the gospels we see it perfectly in the time of christ right because if you read the Gospels carefully, you realize that there's a perfect balance that Jesus strikes between, on the one hand, he's not a revolutionary itinerant preacher. He attended synagogue. He says in Matthew 23, the scribes and the Pharisees are theologically correct. He says they had the authority, right? So the official church was the Jewish nation, Israel, scribes and Pharisees. He says that very clearly in Matthew 23. But at the same time, he also says that they are hypocrites in as the religious leaders. Somebody mute, please. And then he turns around and says to the woman at the well, and if you listen to the Orthodox liturgy, the woman at the well is the archetypal schismatic because she was part of the Samaritans who were a schismatic sect set up under Jeroboam. It was a state-run cult. Jesus says, you know not what you worship. You worship what you don't know salvation is of the jews you are in error he says but who was more likely and who came into the kingdom the woman at the well or the pharisees the woman at the well so we have to be very careful that we don't like fall into two different extremes here of sadducee liberalism which didn't believe in miracles didn't believe in angels or resurrection and hyper rigorism of the Pharisees, which focused on minutia, overlooked the weightier matters of the law, and were so self righteous and in prelest that they didn't even enter the kingdom, and in fact incurred a greater condemnation than the tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus says the worst condemnation will be for you Pharisees, you see. So remember these extremes, and then remember that Jesus perfectly charted the middle course of Sulla and Charybdis, and that. The humility comes in terms of the, remember the guy in the, the, the story of the publican and the Pharisee, right? The publican enters the kingdom and the Pharisee doesn't because he, even though he's a sinner, he goes to the service and he's there to repent. And the Pharisee is there to like look down upon him and say, well, I thank God that I'm not like this man over here who's a sinner, blah, blah, blah. So there's two extremes. We don't want to fall into the Pharisee camp of me and my friends alone. We are the true righteous. Everybody else is damned. We don't want to be in the Sadducee camp. And we don't want to look upon everyone else as filthy. Everyone is a damned heretic but me. Because we have to be careful. And everybody knows that all the saints and elders say this. That the the sooner that you exalt yourself, the closer you are to falling and a sinner taking your place, you see. That's the whole warning of the Gospels over and over and over, isn't it? Does that make sense? Total. So, when it comes to people that are schismatics, people that are in heterodox groups, we can love them we can be friends with them we can do everything we can to win them over to our cause but remember also there's limitations to this paul says that 
uh, a man who is a, a heretic reject after the first and second admonition. So if a, if a person is obstinate, and they're not listening to you, then you move on. You don't keep getting into it over and over and over with some obstinate heretic. It's a waste of time, energy. Don't throw your pearls before swine. You move on. Now you can continue to pray for that person. You can be friendly and nice to, to a, you got to set boundaries, right? With these people, but just move on. There's no point in continuing to, and you notice that that's what we do here, right? You people, why aren't you still interacting with so-and-so? Why don't you debate so-and-so? Because there's a certain point at which we make a judgment call and we say, okay, time to move on. We're going to move on to other people. I'm not going to waste my time. Time is very precious. Time is valuable. Don't waste your time as you get older. You will less and less waste your time in life. I'm not going to waste my time arguing with a bunch of goobers who obviously I can tell within one minute of talking to them are not interested in what's true. Like that guy who hopped on here an hour ago, right? That reform stoic guy. That guy's not going to listen to anything that we had to say. That's why I just boot that guy. Get him out of here. Total waste of time, right? He had the chance. He had the opportunity. He could, he could, I'd give him 20 minutes. He could make all the arguments he wants. He didn't do that, right? So that's a waste of time. And you can tell right away, right? Anyway, uh, anybody else? Move on. Let's moving on. Next, next uh, topic. Next issue. Anybody there? Hello. Are you in there? It's not if you can hear me. It's like the the wall up in the Discord, bro. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, so, it's a question about, like, veganism. No. Um, like, so I just want to make it clear, I'm not a vegan, like, I eat meat and stuff. But, like, I have a question about, just like, the, the you know, about arguments against vegans. Okay. Um, so, I know, like, there's a lot of examples in throughout the Bible that you know, eating meat is fine and stuff. The lamb is slain and stuff like there's plenty of examples but like was it I don't know if you know the answer to this but what is it the case that a pre-fall state like the Edenic state that eating animals or meat was sin or is it just like the post-fall uh, so a lot of people misunderstand this um, actually you're correct in Eden nobody ate meat uh, that we know of exactly. Um, there's some debate over what the, you know, m making skins means. But regardless, uh, m humans don't eat meat until Noah. So it's at Noah that God says, you may now eat meat. So presumably, uh, we don't know what the wicked were up to. They might have been engaging in cannibalism for all we know. That might have been part of the reason why there was a flood. That's a lot of speculation. But for God's people, it's not. they're not told until Noah, Genesis 8, 9, right, that now you may eat meat. Uh, so that's a, a, an allowance after the flood. And then if you read Acts 15, when the Gentiles are uh, brought into the church, uh, what happens is that the apostles have their counsel in, in Acts 15. And they say, okay, we're not going to require of Gentile converts anything more than was required in the covenant of Noah. Because if Noah, who was obviously everybody knows a Gentile, if he could be made righteous at that time, then we are not going to require anything more than was required of Noah for entering the covenant, so to speak. So all Acts 15 is, is a restatement of the Noahic covenant, which says, uh, don't eat strangled meat, cook your food, right? Just basic principles like that. So yes, meat eating is allowable, uh, not just because of Noah, but also in the New Testament. And then we get Paul saying to Timothy, that false teachers will come along and they'll try to erect a fake uh, morality and a fake ethical code by which they say that it's wrong to marry and it's wrong to eat flesh. So Gnostics, Ebionites, right? And within a few centuries, the early church fathers, the first of which is St. Hippolytus, he has a treatise on heresies and he mentions the Brahmins. He says the Brahmins taught a doctrine of vegetarianism and not meeting eat. And so they would ethically enforce that, you, that it's morally wrong to eat meat. They are condemned. They're not just condemned there. They're condemned, again, uh, in, in totality in, in some of the early councils, but also in St. John Damascus' book uh, on heresies, where he lists three or four uh, heretical sects, uh, the Ebionites, the Pythagoreans, and one or two other groups, the Tatianites, 
Gnostics, Marcionites, different groups that would enforce vegetarianism. And it's unanimously, consistently condemned by the church fathers all across the board. And a lot of people don't know this too. Remember everybody, veganism is an ethical position. It is not a diet-based position. So when the vegans are telling you that you have to be vegan, it's not about your diet. In fact, they know that it is not advantageous most of the time for humans to eat that goober stupid diet. And they tell you that it doesn't matter. Yes, it may be bad for your health, but you have a duty ethically to accept bad for your health things because veganism is an ethical position, not a dietary position. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, Jay. Um, Jay, I want to ask... Um, yeah, just go ahead. So again, Tristan, uh, the the attitude is that the food should be cooked. Uh, I'm not saying that it's always wrong to eat sushi. It's not a. It's. I think the attitude of why the food is to be cooked is because of the ancient world's attitude towards what might make you sick. So yes, I'm I'm sure that plenty of people eat rare food or eat sushi. I don't think that Acts 15 is implying that it's always wrong to eat sushi but um but about if you look at the prescription for example of the council of gangra which you mentioned against these people it's more about blood and this this thing you know um blood pudding blood sausage and so on many parts of the orthodox world would not be permitted and it's this link with you know um uh, saint james is a very so he's, he's the president of the council of Acts 15 and he's a very uh sacerdotal figure so it's, it might also be referring to the idea that um, since, you know, we are becoming divine, in a sense, by consuming divine blood, uh, as a recognition of our consumption of divine blood, uh, we would give the exclusivity of our blood consumption to, um, to Christ, to divine blood. Yeah, that's an so interesting... It's also mentioned specifically, like, like when they talk about like uncooked foods, it's always about blood. Right. So, uh, Tristan, I'm not trying to counter signal you, but I would disagree that I think that the implication is that it is supposed to be cooked because there is in Levitical law, the pro prohibiting of eating raw flesh. So, uh, yes, it's true that Acts 15 doesn't specifically say you must cook the meat, but it's already presupposed in the way that they're approaching the question. So, and again, it's not a legalistic thing that you can never have something like sushi. I don't think, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, but like Snack said, it has oftentimes been understood in that way. So, uh, Father Deacon, are you there? Do you have any comment on that? No, no, he may have, he, he may, have, may have had to go. Uh, anyway, let's see. We got Vard, $5. Hey, blessings, many years. Do Orthodox understand, how do you understand the mind, body, relationship i've heard physicians claim that physics disproves the soul i don't know how physics can disprove the soul but uh, i know they're wrong but i don't know how to articulate why well if you were here uh, a little bit earlier we did cover uh the discussion from greg bonson on that point and he just makes a really simple kind of basic argument about naturalism and how it's self-refuting so the easiest way to refute that line of argumentation is the naturalist fallacy. So I'm going to put in the chat right now the link to this three minute argument. So Bonson just puts forth a, a simple three minute argument to refute naturalism. Um, and I think that it would help to refute the objection that you're bringing to the table there. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and we did also play that clip earlier in tonight's or today's discussion. So uh, we've gone for about two hours, so I think uh, if we have any last moment uh, questions before we close up, anybody in this in the chats? A quick question. Oh, that, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, what is some of the the basic terminology, like in general, for that you need to know for Christology and Trinitarian theology? Uh, well, there's a good book by uh, Vladimir Lossky called Dogmatic theology and he has basically a pretty uh, useful uh, glossary at the back of the book where he defines kind of the ma the basic ideas of hypostasis and nature and um, energies and and this kind of stuff 
So that would be a good kind of rough book, but um, um, the the basics would be, I think David has some videos too, David the Real Med White, on the basic terms that you want to know, but, uh, you know, person, nature, energy, will, tropos, mode, right, the, uh, uh, in hypostatize, those are all key words that we want to know. Okay, thanks. Sure. Jay, I, I had a quick one. It was sure. something that came up on Twitter. Go ahead. Um, it's about... It's about saying basil. I just want you to comment real quick because uh-huh. now the reformed and their terrible arguments against us are now trying to claim several St. Basil's letters we have, like letter 360 or forgeries. I don't know off the top of my head what, what 360 is. Uh, now, some of Basil's letters have been thought to be Gregory of Nyssa, like letter 38 is on nature and person is now believed to be Gregory of Nyssa. But I don't like what is what exactly does that I mean, who cares what a reform person thinks? And 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 I, what is letter number three hundred sixty? I don't know off the top of my head what it is. Are you there? Excuse me. Oh, um, it's it's the letter from Saint Basil talking about iconography, because you know they're iconoclasts. So they're trying to argue that any patristic evidence for venerating icons has to be forged okay well everybody doubts the i mean there's plenty of people who doubt the uh, authenticity of the epiphanius uh uh essay against iconography <laughs> so um it doesn't really matter if ba- i mean our argument for and belief in iconography doesn't hinge on a letter from basil i mean it hinges on the principle behind the incarnation the real presence in the eucharist sacramentalism i mean that's the basis for why we believe that icons you know do what they do it's not it's not all hinging on you know a letter from basil yeah may I just um chime in sure. so yeah um if you're looking for a critical perspective there's always going to be some level of criticism now this letter is really um on its face uh, in terms of uh, uh of iconography because it literally says that uh, it venerates icons um if you want to prove iconography from saint basil i would maybe be a bit careful I would not use stuff that you know they might refuse or they might uh, debate because you know there's always uh, some level if you're in a critical mindset there's always a way in which you would you wouldn't use it so if you want to pro iconography from saint basil you can you can use many of his letters when he refers to um glory given to the type being transferred to the prototype and we've got all, all of these ideas um so it, it's just talking about the trinity but you can show that there's a principle here and i think there's also um there's also something from him t- talking about the uh, image of the emperor you know in order to, to, to yeah to it passes uh, the, 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 the so, so i think that instead of using this one which can be debated and i understand why it can be debated because it's it seems very obvious and uh, there are some that are you know uh, there are some um, actually uh, there, i know there's a fake uh, quote by athanasius on icons but um instead of using this one you can you can show that actually St. Basil already understood the principle of iconography and actually applied it to his Trinitarian theology. And now, which, uh, and now the Seven Councils is just doing that in reverse, which is just a natural return, return to source. But if you want to go from a full on uh, church perspective, then you, you'll be a bit less critical. But if you're talking to Price, then please accept that they can have some criticism. You know, we also have some criticism of some documents in, in, in other contexts, you know. Yeah, I mean, they always pick it. They just do this game where they like uh, quote mine to find a church father who disagreed at some point. Okay, but so what? Like, what does that prove? Because nobody is hinging the position on every church father having a unanimous agreement at every stage. I mean, there wouldn't be councils if everybody agreed, right? So uh, it really doesn't matter. And and Snack's right that uh, I wouldn't hinge the argument on a dubious letter. I would just point out the principles that the Seventh Council uses. If you read St. Theodore's book on the holy icons he uses the argument like like uh type prototype that that snack just mentioned so yeah that makes sense uh dia on fire ten dollars thank you very much bantu says will you debate oh i don't know what that says one of the best defenders of animal sacrifice polygamy and african animism Proceeds will go to the American, will be paid in American rubles. Yes, I will debate the name that I can't pronounce. Absolutely. Ready to do it. All right. Thank you, guys. Everybody have a good night. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. And uh, 
I don't know what we're going to do next. We'll, we'll, we'll do some more of these. I mean, people seem to like these open forum Q&As. So and we always 